The Iliad by Homer, Book One. Wrath, sing, goddess, of the wrath of Achilles, Peleus's son, that destructive wrath which brought countless woes upon the Achaeans, and which sent forth to Hades so many valiant souls of heroes, leaving their bones and flesh as spoil for dogs and every bird. Here's the account of how Zeus's plan came to fulfillment from the time when Agamemnon, son of Atreus and king of men, and brilliant Achilles first parted in strife. Which of the gods was it then that brought these two together to contend? Indeed, it was Apollo, son of Leto and Zeus. Agamemnon, the son of Atreus, had wrought dishonor upon the priest Chryses, and so out of anger against the king, Apollo had roused an evil pestilence throughout the host, and the people began to perish. Chryses had come to the swift ships of the Achaeans to free his daughter, bearing ransom beyond counting. And in his hands he held a staff of gold, bearing the wreaths of Apollo, the archer god who strikes from afar. And he implored all of the Achaeans, but most of all the two sons of Atreus, the marshalers of the people. Sons of Atreus and other well-grieved Achaeans, may the gods who have homes upon Olympus grant you favor and success in sacking the city of Priam, and watch over your safe return to your homes. But release my dear child to me, and accept the ransom out of reverence for the son of Zeus, the mighty Apollo who strikes from afar. Then all the rest of the Achaeans shouted their assent both to reverence the priest and to accept the glorious ransom. Yet Agamemnon's heart remained defiant. He dismissed him harshly and laid upon him this stern command. Let me not find you, old man, by the hollow ships, either tarrying now or coming back later, lest your staff and the wreath of the god not protect you. I will not set your daughter free. I will see to it that old age comes upon her in our house, in Argos, far from her native land, working the loom and serving my bed. Now leave. I'll not be able to guarantee your safe return if you continue to anger me here. Seized with fear, the old man obeyed and left without a word, following the thunderous, crashing waves along the seashore. When he had put some distance between himself and the king, the old man prayed earnestly to the Lord Apollo whom fair-haired Leto bore. Hear me, God of the Silver Bow, who stand over Chrysi and Holy Scylla, and rule mightily over Tenedos. O Smynthian God, if ever I completed the construction of a temple to your pleasing, or if ever I found favor in your eyes by my burned offerings to you of fat thigh pieces of bulls and goats, Fulfill this prayer for me. Let the Danaeans pay for my tears by your arrows. So he spoke in prayer, and Phoebus Apollo heard him. Down from the peaks of Olympus he strode, angered at heart, bearing on his shoulders his bow and quiver. The arrows rattled on the angry god's shoulders with every step, and his coming was like the night. Then he sat down, apart from the ships, and let an arrow fly. Terrible was the twang of the silver bow. First assailed were the mules and the swift dogs, but then on the men themselves he let his stinging shafts fly, striking again and again, and soon the pyres of the dead burnt thick and without cease. For nine days the missiles of the god rained down upon the host, but on the tenth the white-armed goddess Hera pitied the Danaeans whom she saw dying in droves, and put it in Achilles' heart to call the people to assembly. They soon gathered into a crowd, and swift-footed Achilles rose and spoke. Agamemnon, son of Atreus, we've been beaten back again. The time has come for us to set sail and return home, and even so, we may still not escape with our lives, so ravaged are we by both war and pestilence. But come, let us ask some seer or priest or some reader of the dreams that Zeus sends who might tell us why Phoebus Apollo is so angry, whether he finds fault with a vow or some incorrect sacrifice we might have made. He may accept the savour of lambs and unblemished goats and be willing to ward off the pestilence from us. When he had thus spoken, he sat down, and among them arose Calchas, son of Thestor, by far the best of the bird diviners, who knew the things that once were, that were now, and that had yet to be and who had guided the ships of the Achaeans to Ilios by his own prophetic powers, which Phoebus Apollo had bestowed upon him. He addressed the gathering with good intent and spoke among them. Achilles, dear to Zeus, 
You bid me explain the wrath of Apollo, the Lord who strikes from afar. Therefore, I will speak. However, I ask that you consider a moment and swear that you will readily defend me with both your word and your mighty hand. For I fear I shall anger a man who rules mightily over the Argives and whom the Achaeans obey. For a king who is angry at a lesser man is mighty indeed. Even if he swallows down his wrath for that day, resentment continues to ferment in his heart till he contains it no longer. Assure me then that you will keep me safe. Swift-footed Achilles answered, Take heart, Calchas, and declare whatever oracle you know, for by Apollo, to whom you pray when you reveal oracles to the Danaeans, no one shall lay a finger on you while I live and have sight on the earth. Not a single one among the whole host of the Danaeans, not even Agamemnon, who now claims to be by far the greatest of the Achaeans. Encouraged by this speech, the blameless seer spoke. I assure you, it is not because of a vow that he finds fault among us, nor because of an incorrect hecatom, but because of the priest whom Agamemnon dishonored by not releasing his daughter and refusing his offered ransom. For this reason, the god who strikes from afar has sent woes and will continue to send them. He will not drive off from the Danaeans the loathsome pestilence until we give the bright-eyed maiden back to her dear father, unbought, unransomed, and also dedicate a sacred hecatomb to Chrysi. Then we might appease and persuade him. With these words he sat down, and among them arose Agamemnon, the wide ruling warrior, son of Atreus, with eyes blazing like fire and a heart wholly filled with rage. He stared menacingly at Calchas and snarled, Prophet of evil, never have you spoken to me a pleasant thing. Prophecies of evil are ever dear to your heart, but a word of good you have never yet spoken nor brought to pass. And now among the Danaeans you claim in prophecy that the god who strikes from afar brings woes upon them because I would not accept the glorious ransom for the girl, the daughter of Chryses, since I much prefer to keep her in my home. There's no question I certainly prefer her to Clytemnestra, my wedded wife, since she is not inferior to her in either form, in stature, in mind, or in any handiwork. Yet even so, I am willing to return her if it is better. I'd rather the people be safe than perish. But for the sake of propriety, provide me forthwith with a prize of honour, lest I alone of the Argives be without one. For as you all see, my prize goes elsewhere. Swift-footed, brilliant Achilles answered, Most glorious son of Atreus, most covetous of all, how do you propose that the great-hearted Achaeans give you this prize? There's no stored up common hoard of wealth. Whatever we took by pillage from the cities has already been apportioned, and the army would not look favorably upon being asked to surrender their spoils for this purpose. But simply return the girl to the god, and we Achaeans will recompense you three and fourfold when Zeus grants us success in sacking the well-walled city of Troy. Lord Agamemnon responded with scorn, Mighty Achilles. Nay, godlike Achilles, do not thus seek to deceive me with your wit, for you will neither get by me nor persuade me. You would order me to give her back, and then happily watch me sit here idly in want, so that you, yourself, may keep your own prize? No, my condition is clear. The great-hearted Achaeans are to give me a prize, suiting it to my mind so that it will be worth just as much if they do not. It is your prize, Achilles, that I will come and take. Yours, or that of Aeus, or that of Odysseus, that I will seize and bear away. He to whom I come will know anger, great anger, without a doubt. But let us not burden ourselves yet with these matters. The time to consider them will come soon enough. For now, let us drag a black ship on the shining sea, and quickly gather suitable rowers into it, and place on board a hecatom, as well as the fair-cheeked daughter of Chryses herself. Let one prudent man be its commander, either Aeus, or Idomeneus, or brilliant Odysseus, or you, son of Peleus, of all men most extreme, so that on our behalf you may propitiate the god who strikes from afar by offering sacrifice. Swift-footed Achilles glared at Agamemnon and spoke, you clothe yourself in shamelessness and think only of profit. How shall any man of the Achaeans obey your words with a ready heart, either to go on a journey or to fight against men with force? I didn't come here to fight because of the Trojan spearmen. They have done me no wrong. 
They've never driven off my cattle or my horses, nor have they ever laid waste to the harvest in deep-soiled Fithia. For many things lie between us, shadowy mountains and sounding sea, but you, shameless one, you we followed, so that you might rejoice, seeking to win recompense from the Trojans, for Melanos, and for your dog-faced self. This you disregard and take no heed of, and now you threaten that you will take my prize away from me? The prize which the sons of the Achaeans gave to me and for which I toiled so hard? Whenever the Achaeans sack a well-inhabited citadel of the Trojans, you always receive the lion's share. Never does my prize even come close. The brunt of furious battle do my hands undertake. But if ever an apportionment comes, your prize is always the greater. While small but dear is the reward that I take to my ships. When I have worn myself out in fighting, I will go back to Phythia now, since it is far better to return home with my beaked ships. I do not intend to pile up riches and wealth for you, while I am here dishonoured. Then the king of men, Agamemnon, answered him. Flee then, if your heart urges you. I do not beg you to remain for my sake. With me are others who will honour me, and above all Zeus, the lord of counsel. Of all the kings that Zeus nurtures, most hateful to me are you, for always strife is dear to you, and wars and battles. If you are very strong, it was a god, I think, who gave you this gift. Go home with your ships and your companions, and lord it over the Myrmidons. I care not for you, nor do I take heed of your wrath. But I will threaten you thus, as Phoebus Apollo takes from me the daughter of Chryses, her with my ship and my companions I will send back, but I will myself come to your tent and take your prize, the fair-faced Briseis, so that you will understand how much mightier I am than you, and another might think again before declaring himself my equal and likening himself to me, to my face. So he spoke. Grief came upon Achilles, son of Peleus, and within his shaggy breast his heart was divided, whether he should draw his sharp sword from beside his thigh and break up the assembly and slay the son of Atreus, or stay his anger and curb his spirit. While he pondered this in mind and heart, and was drawing from his sheath his great sword, Athena came down to him from above. The white-armed goddess Hera had sent her forth. For in her heart she loved and cared for both men. Athena grasped Achilles's hair from behind, and as he turned around, he was seized with wonder, immediately recognizing Pallas Athena, who had appeared to him and to none other. Her eyes blazed with a terrible light. Then Achilles addressed her with winged words and said, Daughter of Aegis bearing Zeus, why now have you come? Is it so that you might see the arrogance of Agamemnon, son of Atreus, for yourself? I will say this now, and may it be brought to pass, through his own excessive pride shall he presently lose his life. Bright-eyed goddess Athena answered then, I have come from heaven to stay your anger if you'll obey. The white-armed goddess Hera sent me forth, for in her heart she loves and cares for both of you. But come, cease from strife, and do not grasp the sword with your hand. With words indeed taunt him, telling him how it shall be. For thus will I speak, and this thing shall truly be brought to pass. Hereafter, three times as many glorious gifts shall be yours on account of this arrogance, but refrain and obey us. In answer to her spoke swift-footed Achilles, It is necessary, goddess, to observe the words of you both, however angered a man be in his heart, for it is better so. After all, it is to whomever obeys the gods that, in turn, they gladly lend their ear. Thus he spoke and stayed his heavy hand on the silver hilt, thrusting the great sword back into its sheath, unwilling to disobey the word of Athena. And so she returned to Olympus, to the palace of Aegis bearing Zeus, to join the company of the other gods. Nevertheless, Achilles addressed the son of Atreus once again with violent words and in no way desisted from his wrath. Bloated with wine, with the face of a wolf, but the heart of a frightened deer. Never have you had courage to arm yourself for battle along with your people, or to go to an ambush with the chiefs of the Achaeans. <laughs> not you. Death seems far too close that way, does it not? Indeed, how comfortable you find the middle of the battalion, the better to deprive of his prize, whoever speaks contrary to you. You parasite, ruler of naught, 
Else, son of Atreus, this would be your last piece of insolence. But hear me now as I swear this mighty oath. See here this staff, this staff that has never put forth leaves or shoots since it first left its stump among the mountains. Nor shall it ever again grow green, for blades of bronze have stripped it on all sides of leaves and bark. Well, this is the staff which the sons of the Achaeans carry in their hands when they act as judges, those who guard the ordinances that come from Zeus. By this staff shall I make this mighty oath. Some day, without fail, a desperate time will fall upon the sons of the Achaeans, and to a man all will long for the support of Achilles. On that day you will be powerless to help them for all your grief, when many shall fall, dying before Hector, slayer of men. But you will gnaw at the heart within your own breast, in fury that you did no honour to the best of the Achaeans. Thus speaking, the son of Peleus threw down to earth the staff studded with golden nails, and sat himself down, while over against him the son of Atreus continued to vent his wrath. And then among them arose Nestor, sweet of speech, the clear-voiced orator of the Pylians, from whose tongue flowed speech sweeter than honey. Two generations of mortal men had already passed away in his lifetime, and he was king among the third. He addressed the gathering with good intent and spoke among them. Comrades, great grief has come upon the land of Achaea. Truly would Priam and the sons of Priam rejoice, and how glad at heart would the rest of the Trojans be, were they to hear all this of you two quarrelling. You who are chief among the Danaeans in council and chief in war, listen to me, for you are both younger than I. In earlier times I moved among men more war-ready than you. Never did they despise me. Never before had I seen, nor will I ever see again, such warriors as Perithus and Dryas, shepherd of the people, and Canaeus and Exadius, and godlike Polyphemus and Theseus, son of Aegeus, a man like the immortals. Mightiest were these of men reared upon the earth, mightiest were they, and with the mightiest, the mountain-dwelling centaurs, they fought, and they destroyed them terribly. These men called for me to join them from my distant land of Pylos, and I answered their call, sailing over and finding a rightful place among them, and I held my own in battle. Not one of the mortals now upon the earth would stand a chance in fight with those men. Yes, and they listened to my counsel, and obeyed my words. So also should you now obey. It is in your interest, mighty though you are, son of Atreus. You should not take away the girl, but let her be, as the sons of the Achaeans first gave her to him as a prize. Nor should you, son of Peleus, be minded to strive with a king, might against might. For the portion of the scepter-holding king to whom Zeus gives glory is no common honour. You may be a stronger fighter, being the son of a goddess, no less. Yet he is the mightier, since he is king over more, and so, Lord Agamemnon, calm your rage. Indeed, I beg you to let go your anger against Achilles, who is for all the Achaeans a fortress of might in evil war. In answer to him spoke Lord Agamemnon. All these things, old man, you have spoken as is right without a doubt. But this man wishes to be above all others. Clearly, he wishes to rule and be king, and to all to give orders. These are not the traits of a man who will willingly obey. If the eternal gods make him a spearman, do they therefore license him to keep uttering insults? At this, Achilles broke in. Surely I would be called a coward of no account if I were to yield to you in every matter that you say. On others lay these commands, but do not give orders to me, for it is clear that I shall obey you no longer. And another thing I will tell you, and take this to heart, I will not fight for the girl's sake, either with you nor with any other, since you are taking away what you have given. But, of all else that is mine by my ship, nothing will you take away against my will. Come, just try while you have an audience. Forthwith will your blackened blood flow forth upon my spear. When the quarrel finally came to an end, the two men rose, and the gathering broke up. Achilles went his way, to his huts and his ships, together with the son of Menoetius and with his men, while Agamemnon chose twenty rowers to board one of his swift ships, along with a hecatomb for the god and the fair daughter of Chryses, before sending them out to sea, led by Odysseus, who also went on board to take command. And as these embarked and sailed over the waters, Agamemnon bade the people purify both themselves and their camp. And so they did.
casting any defilement into the water and offering to Apollo perfect hecatoms of bulls and goats by the barren shore. And the fragrance and savour thereof went up to heaven, swirling up amid the smoke. Thus were they busied throughout the camp, but Agamemnon's heart did not desist from the strife with which he had first threatened Achilles, but called to Talthybius and Eurybates, who were his heralds and ready squires. Go to Achilles's hut, and take the fair-cheeked Briseis by the hand, and lead her here. And if he will not surrender the girl, I will go myself with a larger company and take her. It will be better for him that he hand her over to you at once. So saying, he sent them forth, and laid upon them a stern command. The two went unwillingly along the shore of the barren sea, and came to the tents and the ships of the Myrmidons. They found Achilles sitting beside his tent and his black ship, and Achilles was not glad to see them. The two, seized with dread and in awe of the king, stood and spoke no word to him nor made question, but he knew their purpose in his heart, and he spoke, Hail, heralds, messengers of Zeus and men, draw near, it is not you who are guilty in my sight, but Agamemnon who sent you forth for the sake of the girl Briseis, but come, Patroclus, sprung from Zeus, bring forth the girl, and hand her over to them to be led away. However, if hereafter there shall be any need of me to ward off shameful ruin from the host, let these two themselves be witnesses before the blessed gods and mortal men, and before Agamemnon, that ruthless king. Truly he rages with baneful mind, and knows no prudence of hindsight, nor foresight with which his Achaeans might wage war in safety beside their ships. So he spoke, and Patroclus obeyed his dear comrade, and led Briseis forth from the hut, and gave her to them to lead away. So the two returned to the ships of the Achaeans, and with them, most unwilling, went the woman. But Achilles could not contain his sorrow, and withdrew from the company of his comrades. He sat down on the shore of the grey sea, looking forth over the wine-dark deep, weeping. He prayed earnestly to his dear mother, with hands outstretched, Mother, since you bore me, though to so brief a life span, surely the Olympian Zeus who thunders on high ought to have given honour into my hands? But now I find no honour whatsoever. Truly the son of Atreus, wide-ruling Agamemnon, has dishonoured me, for he has taken my prize and keeps it through his own arrogance. Tears overflowing, this is how he spoke, and her ladyship, his mother, heard him, as she sat in the watery depths beside her father Nereus, the old man of the sea. In an instant she emerged from the sea like a mist, and sat down before him as he wept, and placing a gentle hand upon him, she spoke to him, calling him by name. My child, why do you weep? What sorrow has come upon your heart? Speak out, hide it not in your mind that we both may know. With heavy groans, Achilles answered, You already know all. What purpose would it serve for me to tell you? We went forth to Cilician Thebe, to the sacred city of Eetion. We laid it waste and brought here all the spoil. The sons of the Achaeans divided it all properly among themselves, but for the son of Atreus they chose out the most beautiful daughter of Chryses. However, Chryses, priest of Apollo, came to the swift ships of the bronze-clad Achaeans to free his daughter, bearing ransom past counting. And in his hands he held a staff of gold, bearing the wreaths of Apollo, who strikes from afar. And he implored all the Achaeans, but most of all the two sons of Atreus, marshallers of the people. Then all the rest of the Achaeans shouted assent to reverence the priest and accept the glorious ransom. Yet the thing did not please Agamemnon, son of Atreus. But he sent him away harshly and laid upon him a stern command. So the old man left in anger, and Apollo heard his prayer, for he was very dear to him, and sent against the Argives a devastating shaft. Then the people began to die thick and fast, and the shafts of the god ranged everywhere throughout the wide camp of the Achaeans. But the prophet with sure knowledge declared Apollo's oracles to us. My immediate recommendation was to propitiate the god, but then anger seized the son of Atreus, and he arose forthwith and began to direct threats at me. Well, his threat has now come to pass, for the quick-glancing Achaeans are taking Agamemnon's maiden in a swift ship back to Chrysae along with gifts to the god, while the other woman, the daughter of Briseis, whom the sons of the Achaeans gave me, the heralds have now just taken from my tent and led away. 
But you, if you are able, guard your own son. Go to Olympus and petition Zeus, son of Kronos, if ever you have gladdened his heart by word or deed. For often I have heard you declaring in the halls of my father that you alone among the immortals warded off shameful ruin from Zeus, lord of the dark clouds. On the day when the Olympians, Hera and Poseidon and Pallas Athene, wished to put him in bonds. But you came to him, goddess, and freed him from his bonds by quickly calling the son of Gaia and Uranus, he of fifty heads and a hundred hands whom the gods call Briarius, but whom all men called Aegeon, for he is mightier than his father. You called him to Mount Olympus, and he sat down by Zeus's side, exulting in his glory. And the blessed gods were seized with fear of him and did not bind the son of Cronos. Bring this now to his remembrance, and sit by his side, and clasp his knees in hope that he might perhaps wish to favour the Trojans, and for those others, the Achaeans, to pen them in among the sterns of their ships, and around the sea as they are slain, so that they may all have profit of their king, and the son of Atreus, wide-ruling Agamemnon, may know in his own blindness that he did no honour to Achilles, the best of the Achaeans. Then... The water goddess Thetis answered him as she wept. Ah me, my child, why did I rear you, doomed in my childbearing? Would that it had been your lot to remain by your ships without tears and without grief. The years of your mortal life are already so short, but now it appears that you are fated to an early death and are also laden with sorrow above all men. Therefore to an evil fate I bore you in our halls. Yet in order to carry your word to Zeus, I will myself go to snowy Olympus, in hope that he may be persuaded. But for now, remain quietly beside your ships. Continue to kindle your anger against the Achaeans, but refrain utterly from battle. For Zeus went yesterday to Oceanius, to the blameless Ethiopians, for a feast, and all the gods have followed him there. However, on the twelfth day, he will return to Olympus, and then I will go to the house of Zeus with threshold of bronze and will clasp his knees in prayer, and I think I shall win him. So saying, she went her way and left him where he was, angered at heart for the fair-girdled woman's sake whom they had taken from him by force. Meanwhile Odysseus came to Chrysi, bringing the holy Hecatom. When they had arrived within the deep harbour, they furled the sail, stowed it in the black ship, and the mast they lowered by the four stays, bringing it to the crutch with speed, and rowed her with their oars to the place of anchorage. Then they cast out the mooring stones and made fast the stern cables, and themselves went forth upon the shore of the sea. They brought forth the hecatom for Apollo, and forth stepped also the daughter of Chryses. Odysseus, of many wiles, led her then to the altar, and placed her in the arms of her dear father, saying to him, Chryses, Agamemnon, king of men, sent me forth to bring you your daughter, and to offer to Phoebus Apollo a holy hecatom on the Danaeans' behalf, that therewith we may propitiate the Lord who has now brought upon the Argives such woeful lamentation. So saying, he placed her in his arms, and Chryses joyfully took his dear child. But they wasted no time in setting the holy hecatom for the god all around the well-built altar, and then they washed their hands and took up the barley grains. Then Chryses lifted up his hands, and prayed aloud for them. Hear me, God of the silver bow, who stands over Chrysi and holy Scylla, and rules mightily over Tenedos. As before you heard me when I prayed, to me you did honour, and mightily smote the host of the Achaeans. Even so, fulfil for me presently this desire. Ward off now from the Danaeans the loathly pestilence. So he spoke in prayer, and Phoebus Apollo heard him. Then when they had prayed and had sprinkled the barley grains, they first drew back the heads of the animals and cut their throats and flayed them and cut out the thighs and covered them with a double layer of fat and laid raw flesh thereon. And the old man burnt them on stakes of wood and poured libation over them of glistening wine. And beside him the young men held in their hands the five-pronged forks but when the thigh pieces were wholly burnt and they had tasted the entrails, they cut up the rest and spitted it and roasted it carefully. And then when the meal was ready, they feasted to their heart's content. And once their appetites were sated with food and drink, the youths filled the bowls to the brim with drink and served out to all, first pouring libations for the god into every cup. 
So the whole day long they sought to appease the god with song, with beautiful paeans and hymns, and hearing this, Apollo's heart was glad. When the sun finally set and darkness came on, they found rest and sleep, lying by the stern cables of the ship, and as soon as rosy-fingered dawn broke over the horizon, they set sail once again to return to the white camps of the Achaeans. And Apollo, who works from afar, sent them a favouring wind, and they set up the mast and spread the white sail. So the wind filled the belly of the sail, and the dark waves sang loudly around the stern of the ship as she went. And she sped over the waves to her destination. They drew the black ship up on the shore, high upon the sands of the white camp of the Achaeans, and set in line the long props beneath, before spreading out among the tents and the ships. And still Achilles, Zeus sprung son of Peleus, sat beside his swift-faring ships, his wrath smouldering. Never did he go forth to the place of gathering where men win glory, nor even to war, though he felt the valour of his heart waning in idleness, and he longed for the war cry and the battle. Twelve days passed, and at last, into Olympus, the ever-living gods returned, all in one company with Zeus leading the way. And Thetis did not forget her son's request, but rose up from the wave of the sea, and in the early morning went up to great heaven and Olympus. There she found the far-seeing son of Cronus sitting apart from the rest, upon the topmost peak of many-ridged Olympus. She sat herself down before him, and with her left hand upon his knees, she reached up with her right to touch him beneath the chin, and she spoke in prayer to King Zeus, son of Cronus. Father Zeus, if ever amid the immortals I gave you aid by word or deed, grant me this prayer. Do honour to my son, who is doomed to death with a haste beyond all other men, Yet now Agamemnon, king of men, has dishonoured him, for he has taken his prize and keeps her by his own arrogant act. But honour him, Olympian Zeus, lord of council, and give might to the Trojans until the Achaeans do honour to my son and magnify him with reward. So she pleaded, and all the while Zeus the cloud-gatherer spoke not a word, simply sitting in silence. Thetis clasped his knees tighter, clinging close, appealing to him once again. Give me your infallible promise, nod clearly your assent, or else deny me, what could you possibly fear? Deny me and let me know just how deeply you despise me by honouring me least among all the gods. Greatly troubled, the cloud-gatherer Zeus finally broke his silence. Ah, surely this will be sorry work. You would set me on a course for strife with my wife Hera. Her infuriating taunts will never cease. Even now she always reproaches me in front of all the other immortal gods and claims that I give aid to the Trojans in battle. Come, leave now with haste, lest Hera suspect something and I will give these matters thought to bring all to pass. Now see well, I will bow my head to you so that you may be certain. For this from me is the surest token among the immortals. No word of mine to which I bow my head may be recalled, nor is false, nor unfulfilled. The son of Kronos spoke and bowed his dark brow in assent, and the ambrosial locks waved from the king's immortal head, and he made great Olympus quake. When the two had taken counsel together in this way, they parted. Thetis leapt from gleaming Olympus straight into the deep sea, and Zeus went to his own place. All the gods rose from their seats before the face of their father, no one dared to address him, but they all rose up before him. So he sat down there upon his throne. But Hera was not blind, her husband's counsel with silver-footed Thetis had not eluded her. With mockery dancing upon her tongue, she spoke up. Who of the gods has taken counsel with you this time, O crafty one? You always delight in keeping your secrets from me, and you take pleasure in making decisions on considerations you have pondered alone. Nor have you ever readily shared with me any of your schemes which you prefer to devise in hiding." The father of men and gods answered, Hera, uh, do not hope to know all my words. You might find them hard to bear, even though you are my wife. Whatever is fitting for you to hear, no other god or man shall know before you, but what I wish to devise apart from the gods. Of this I ask you to neither inquire nor ask." The ox-eyed Lady Hera exclaimed, 
Most dread son of Kronos, such words you pronounce. Have I ever been known before to inquire or ask of your connivances? I believe that at your ease you devise whatever you wish as you wish. But now I have wondrous dread at heart, lest silver-footed Thetis, daughter of the old man of the sea, have entranced you. For at early dawn she sat by you and clasped your knees. To her I am quite sure you bowed your head in sure token that you will honor Achilles and bring many to death beside the ships of the Achaeans. Zeus answered in anger. Strange one, you are always suspecting and I do not escape you, yet you shall be able to accomplish nothing, but shall be even further apart from my heart, and that shall be worse for you. If this thing is indeed as you say, then it must be pleasing to me. Sit down in silence and obey my word, lest all the gods that are in Olympus avail you not against my drawing near when I put forth upon you my irresistible hands. He spoke, and ox-eyed Lady Hera was seized with fear and sat down in silence, curbing her heart. A great unease spread among the gods of the heaven throughout the palace of Zeus, and among them Hephaestus, the famed craftsman, was first to speak, doing pleasure to his dear mother, white-armed Hera. What good can come of this, this fighting between the two of you, for mortals' sakes? There will be an uproar, and the gods will not bear it. Neither will there be any joy in this excellent feast, since always worse things prevail. And so I give counsel to my mother, wise as she is, to do pleasure to our dear father Zeus, so that he has no further cause to chastise her again and disturb our feast. Consider, what if the Lord of the Lightning were minded to dash us from our seats, for he is mightiest by far. Indeed, dear mother, address him with gentle words, so shall the Olympian forthwith be gracious to us. So saying, he sprang up and placed in his dear mother's hand the double cup, and spoke to her. Be patient, my mother, and endure in spite of your grief. Lest, dear as you are to me, my eyes see you stricken, for I shall in no way be able to protect you for all my sorrow. Indeed, a formidable foe is the Olympian to meet in strife. There was a time when I was striving to save you, and on that occasion he caught me by the foot and hurled me from the heavenly threshold. The whole day long I was carried headlong, until at sunset I crashed upon the ground in Lemnos with but little life remaining in my breast. I was lucky to be so well aided by the Sintian folk, who quickly tended me for my fall. Listening to her son, the goddess white-armed Hera smiled graciously, and took in her hand the cup from her son. Then he poured wine for all the other gods in attendance, drawing forth sweet nectar from the bowl. And unquenchable laughter arose once again among the blessed gods in sight of Hephaestus so out of breath from his efforts throughout the palace. Thus, the whole day long, until the setting of the sun, they feasted to their heart's content, to the sound of Apollo's beauteous lyre, and to the sweet voices of the muses, who sang one in reply to another. And when sun's bright light finally set, each retired to their own domain to take their rest, where for each one... Famed Hephaestus, the limping god, had built a palace with masterful skill. And Zeus the Olympian, lord of the lightning, went to his couch, where of old he took his rest whenever sleep came upon him. And there he settled and slept, and beside him lay Hera of the Golden Throne.